Hey everyone, my name's Tomato Anus, also known as Dinky Joe Johnson, and this is a segmented any percent speedrun of Bioshock 2. This run is performed by KPC Zombie, the current world record holder for this category, who not only helped me write the script for this video to make sure it's all as accurate as possible, but also was the runner who helped me make the video on this channel covering the any percent run of the original Bioshock. That video is in no way required reading before watching this one, but the games are super similar mechanically, so there is a fair bit of information overlap. If you haven't watched that video, you'll be totally fine with understanding the contents of this video. If you'd prefer to watch either this any percent run of Bioshock 2 without commentary or KPC's current world record, they're both linked in the description. With this being any percent, glitches are allowed, so if that isn't your cup of tea, I've linked the current glitchless record in the description as well, which, fun fact, KPC holds the record for too. Also worth noting is that this is a run of the original 2010 release and not the 2016 remaster since there are a few glitches that either don't work or are much harder in the remaster. So the plot setup for Bioshock 2 is that we play as Subject Delta, the first big daddy to successfully pair bond with a little sister, and her name is Eleanor. In 1958, around two years before the events of the first game, Delta and Eleanor are romping around Rapture and harvesting Adam when they're attacked by a group of splicers. Delta fights off most of them before getting hit by a hypnotized plasmid, which is when a woman named Sophia Lamb shows up. She reveals that Eleanor is her daughter, and she forces Delta to put a pistol to his head and pull the trigger. Fast forward 10 years to 1968, eight years after the events of the first game, and Delta is revived at a Vita chamber and begins receiving telepathic messages from Eleanor pleading for help. Sophia Lamb is now in control of Rapture, and something that exists now are Big Sisters, who are first-generation little sisters who have grown up, are highly aggressive, and can use plasmids they absorbed from gathering as a child. Big sisters are sent out to coastlines along the Atlantic by Sophia to kidnap little girls and turn them into new little sisters, but I think that Delta might have something to say about that. Alright, with all that covered, let's get into the previously on Tomato Anus. Honestly, you did great. Huh, that jacket must have been a time machine. Great. Huh. This jacket must be a time machine. Looks tis be, sire! How do you know what a time machine is? My cousin owned one before he died! Oh, what was his name? Eric! I don't know why I asked what his name was and not yours. That was really rude. I'm gonna pretend you mentioned NordVPN and talk at you about them now. Okay. NordVPN is a VPN that protects your internet connection and privacy online, especially when gaming, and they recently launched the threat protection feature. I don't know what any of that- It's a feature you enable on the app that blocks malicious websites, malware, trackers, and intrusive ads, even if you're not connected to a VPN server at the time. With Nord, you can also do a double VPN, so people will think you're in Hong Kong when you're actually in Taiwan when you're actually in the US. What tis be an US? You can also game securely with Nord without affecting latency, and you can get a two-year plan plus four months free by going to nordvpn.com slash tomatoanus. It's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Go upon wherest? Go to nordvpn.com slash tomatoanus. Two-year plan with four months free. Huh? Hey, what year is it, by the way? Why, sire, the year tis be 1312. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. So to begin the run, KPC chooses to start a new game, skips the intro cutscene, and then sits through the around 20 second cutscene of Delta waking up with the run officially starting when we gain control. A lot of runners use a pre-made save of right when you gain control to skip the 20 second cutscene, but KPC doesn't mind it since it's not too long. When he gains control, he's going to jump while moving through the water in front of him since it's faster to jump through water than wade, and he'll then use his drill to break some coral. In this game we play as a big daddy, so we have a drill as our default melee weapon, which you can swing to attack by clicking your mouse, or you can drill to attack by holding down your mouse, but doing that drains your fuel, which you can see in the bottom left corner. After hopping on the railing to cut this corner and then drilling some more coral, KPC will crouch under a fallen pillar and hang a right into the next room, which is a room with a pool in it, where he'll grab an audio diary along the left side of the room. In the room after the pool room, he's going to be approaching a gatherer's garden machine to get the electrobolt plasmid when Eleanor will pop on screen doing an impression of Angel from Borderlands. You're unable to interact with anything during her message, but KPC will do something called an audio skip. By pressing T to play his newest unread audio diary, that newest audio diary plays and cuts off whatever messages were already playing, like Eleanor's angel message, and activates any flags or triggers tied to the original message that was playing that got cut off. 
Audio skips are everywhere in the run, so get used to them or get lost. Sorry, that was really rude and aggressive. KPC interacted with the Gatherer's Garden to receive the Electrobolt Plasmid after skipping Eleanor's Angel message. Electrobolt lets him instantly charge people's phones, and getting it also puts him into this cutscene where we get our first up-close glimpse of a big sister who comes along to yoink this little sister after she tells us to find Eleanor. Finding Eleanor is our main goal for the game from the outset, and over the span of nine locations that serve as levels, we'll traverse Rapture and try to find her. After the cutscene, KPC immediately uses lightning with his hands to open the door that shut behind the big sister. After following the path back to the pool room where he picked up the audio diary, he'll two-piece a splicer blocking a control panel which he'll then shock, before turning his attention to another splicer in the room that he two-pieces as well. He then has to wait for a door to open, but when it does, he'll follow the path and go through another door where he'll immediately shock the water in the room to kill the two splicers in it before hopping through the water himself to the left side of the room. At last, a signal. You, who are bringing this dead city to life, listen. There he'll run up a small set of stairs and grab the rivet gun. This game's equivalent to our pistol in the first game, and as soon as the nearby doors open, he'll again go through and take out a splicer on the other side, grabbing some Eve hypo in the process. He then goes through this door to enter a cutscene where we properly meet a big sister for the first time and learn just what they're capable of. The game wants to establish them as a formidable mini-boss like Big Daddy's in the first game, so you're forced to fight this big sister and lose. Rather than struggle in vain and waste resources just to lose the fight, KPC is going to stand by a door and dodge the fireballs the sister shoots at him, which causes the fire to hit the door and set it ablaze. He'll then run into that fire over and over to quickly get down to 1 HP, which, worth mentioning, if you have more than 1 HP and take damage that would kill you, your health instead lowers to 1 HP and you're given a few seconds of invincibility before you're then able to take damage again and die. That's how it works normally, at least. In this fight, you're just not able to die in general due to the rules of the encounter, and that's what prevents the death here, but the invincibility for a few seconds normally kicks in when you get down to 1 HP otherwise. This door is actually the door the sister breaks open after defeating you, so here KPC body blocks the sister into the door so she can't run away after coming in close to melee attack. That way she's already at the door and doesn't need to run to it from across the room when we lose the fight. This lets us leave the room immediately with her, meaning we get to see a second big sister pop out from the right here since the devs didn't expect us to be leaving the combat room so quickly. In this room is a huge glass wall that a big sister is about to break, causing water to rush in that's scripted to push you backwards from where you're looking. KPC immediately looks left when he gains control here so that he's pushed to the right, since that's the direction he'll need to head after he regains control. The pushback isn't pretty, like you swirl all around, and because of it, he has to constantly adjust where he's looking until Delta flips upside down, which is when you can relax and just drift back. Doing this ends you up around 3-4 to four seconds farther up the walking path than where you'd start otherwise. We're now at the first seafloor segment of the game, where you run around in your big daddy suit outside of Rapture. This walk specifically serves the purpose of being our introduction to Rapture as a sprawling city, like how we were in the first game on the entry Bathysphere ride. Rather than observe it from the inside of the bathysphere though, we get a walk around and look at Rapture, with us being intended to take in the marvel of the city when we approach a cliff face up ahead on the left and get our first good look at the city as a whole. Throughout this entire underwater running segment, KPC again jumps constantly, with it being slightly faster than just running the whole time. Over the span of all this running, the constant jumping saves around 5 seconds. As we make our way to the end of the level, something worth calling out is the textures in this game. As you can tell, they don't look too great right now, but that's not because it's a poorly aged game. That fact is entirely up to debate and I'll let you all do that in the comments, but the reason why it looks so bad in this video is because KPC has to do runs of the game with the texture detail setting set to medium. This is because the game crashes a lot, and for some reason having your texture detail set to medium causes it to crash a lot less than playing on low or high. So here KPC just entered an airlock and interacted with a lever to drain the water from it and end the level, wrapping up Adonis Luxury Resort and bringing him to Atlantic Express. At the start of this level, a character from the previous game named Tenenbaum is going to try to talk to us via radio, and KPC is going to perform an audio skip by pressing T to play an audio diary on the exact same frame that the radio message starts, which he times out with a visual cue on the door in front of him. The visual cue is when the tip of the arrow pointing up on the door crosses the top of the screen and out of frame. This doesn't just skip Tenenbaum's message, but breaks and skips all the messages for the full level. It's called a full level audio skip, and it isn't the easiest thing to do since it's frame perfect, but the setup makes it manageable, and runners will typically either make a quick save right beforehand that they can load if they fail, or just load the autosave from the start of the level. So here KPC grabs the hack tool. 
He uses this to shoot remote hack darts to hack things like doors and vending machines, and rather than a pipe puzzle, hacking in this game is as simple as pressing E while the needle passes through a green or blue zone. Here, KPC is going to jump as the hanging submarine falls so that he's in the air when it lands so his screen won't shake as badly, and then he grabs some money that's on the left here. We'll be using money later on in the run to purchase more drill fuel from vending machines. So he just pulled a lever and immediately walked to the back of the room and looked at all the TV screens. Pulling the lever gets him stuck in the room for a bit to listen to messages on the TVs, which start playing on their own after 10 seconds, but the TVs are tied to a look trigger, meaning that they activate when we look at them, so by backing up and looking at the TVs how KPC did, the messages started playing right away. This message is from Sophia Lamb, Eleanor's mother, the person who's in control of Rapture, and this game's Andrew Ryan, but there isn't really anything for us to do while this message plays out. The only thing KPC can really do at the moment is prepare for what's to come, which he'll do by looking left and positioning himself in that direction. The message is going to end soon, and after that, in about 33 seconds, the floor will give out from beneath him, and by standing to the left, he'll land as close to the direction he needs to head as possible. Worth noting is that despite taking a bunch of damage from this part, you cannot die here, and the game actually gives us back full health by the time our HUD returns after going away when we fall. The area he'll land is underwater, so again, he'll jump as he moves. Near the start, he'll purposely hit his head on an overhead pipe, shortening his jump and pushing him down. This times and spaces out his jump so that he doesn't get caught on anything, and also so that he lands right at where he needs to crouch to progress. Coincidentally, this is actually what KPC's name stands for, Kaboshed Progress, Crouch. When he exits the water just up here, he's going to hang a right and then a left, where he'll grab a hacking dart, some money, and a singular sardine that's laying around in the chaos. He'll then take a ride into a room where another Eleanor Angel message will play, which KPC will jump just before so that he travels farther into the room while the game takes away his controls like he just failed his middle school biology test. He's not able to perform an audio skip with this message like the one earlier, and the full level audio skip doesn't affect this message since it's more akin to a cutscene than a radio message. This is why KPC's best route of attack is just the jump he did to get farther into the room so he has less distance to run when he gets control back. Here, KPC tells Eleanor that he prefers one-ply toilet paper, causing her to run away in the cutscene to end, letting him interact with the telekinesis plasmid in front of him, which gives him the ability to, uh, telekinesis things. If you watched our video covering the original Bioshock, then you already know what's coming, and trust me, it's even more insane in this game than that game, but it's gonna be a bit before we get to do the thing. Just hang on, it'll be worth the wait when we get there. After hitting a trigger that closed a big door, KPC uses telekinesis here to remove a pipe from the gears and open the door. While he runs around, you'll see KPC use telekinesis to grab things lying around like Eve Hypo and money, with money management being a big part of the run for making sure you have enough to purchase fuel later from vending machines. After using barrels to clear out splicers, he'll run into an elevator which only begins heading up after you've pressed the button and turn around to face the elevator door. The game normally locks you in place and slowly turns you around on its own, but you can still look around after pressing the button, so KPC turned around quickly on his own to get the elevator moving earlier. He then used telekinesis to grab a small item from the room as the elevator began heading up, which in this run ended up being a splicer's mask. KPC will repeatedly grab the mask, put it above himself, and drop it on his head to nudge himself. He'll do this over and over to slowly move over to the exit of the elevator and stick out of the door. He can't fall out by doing this, so he doesn't have to worry about going too far. When the elevator then approaches the top, KPC's head will collide with the ledge above him, which will push him down through the elevator floor and cause him to fall to his death down the elevator shaft. This will cause him to respawn at a Vita chamber in the level that's on the upper floor right next to where the elevator arrives, skipping the end of the ride and saving around 3 seconds overall. This is called a death warp. When you die in this game, you respawn at a nearby Vita chamber without losing any progress, with there being at least 2 chambers per level. Death warps abuse this and save on walking time by deliberately dying to respawn across the level. <sighs> So when he gets moving out of the Vita chamber, KPC will grab some nearby trap rivets which he'll be using in a moment. After going through this door and a second one up ahead, he's going to grab a trash can with telekinesis which he'll then throw at a splicer that he'll shoot afterwards to kill. In the first Bioshock, telekinesis one-shots pretty much everything, but the devs realized how OP it was and nerfed it in this game. 
After killing the splicer, KPC approached the high school concession stand, which much to my dismay is out of Spino bars, but the parent volunteering at the stand for tonight's game is actually Bridget Tenenbaum, the person who discovered Adam and created the Little Sisters. Half of this cutscene is unskippable dialogue tied to Tenenbaum's animations and movements, while there's a second half that are messages from Sophia Lamb. We have to watch the Tenenbaum part since the full level audio skip doesn't skip her dialogue, but the Sophia Lamb part of the cutscene is entirely skipped. After this cutscene, we're thrown into a combat encounter where there's two tunnels the Splicers spawn in, one on the right and one on the left, with KPC laying down the trap rivets from earlier in the tunnel on the right, clearing out the first of three waves. He'll then take out wave two in the left tunnel with an explosive canister and positions himself behind a pillar while doing so, so security camera doesn't see him and spawn security bots. Wave 3 can spawn from either tunnel, so after assessing that they aren't coming from the left tunnel, KPC throws some explosive canisters in the tunnel on the right, clearing out the final wave. This wraps up this level, and we can now board the tram that's here and activate the lever to ride it to the next level, Ryan Amusements. There, the only reason our tram ride will stop is because the tunnel to the next level is blocked by a bunch of ice. The level has a frame-perfect full-level audio skip as well, but it happens around 15 seconds after the level starts. When he loads in, KPC will line up the radio of Sinclair in the bottom right corner with the yellow buttons behind it to set up his angling for the audio skip, then hold forward as he gains control and make a quick save that he'll then load. The quick save is for in case he messes up the skip and needs to retry it, that way he doesn't have to load the autosave and wait 15 seconds again. He'll load the quick save immediately after making it because this trick has two different timings, one for if you attempt the trick after the quick save screen, and a different one for if you attempt the trick after the quick load screen, and KPC personally prefers the timing after the quick load. Right here is when he gains control, quick saves, quick loads, and performs the audio skip. After looting some luggage for money, KPC continues forward through the door ahead where he'll go up two sets of stairs. After going through the door at the top, he'll then be in the entrance hub area of the Ryan Amusements theme park. There he'll go straight to the security wing on the left, grabbing tons of money with telekinesis along the way. When he enters the security wing here, if you watch the bottom right corner, you'll see a radio message from Sinclair pop up and go away immediately thanks to the full level audio skip. Here KPC approaches the weapon upgrade station just ahead where he chooses to increase the damage of his drill. He then continues deeper into the security wing where after going down these stairs, he shoots a hacking dart through a broken window to be able to hack open the door here. This lets him go into the back room to grab a ticket to the theme park, which is needed to open a door to the rest of the level. On his way back to the theme park entrance hub, KPC is going to come across a splicer who broke into the wing's security inventory and got out a minigun for us to kindly take. It's too bad we don't have time for a Meso's minigun minute. Back in the entrance hub, a bunch of splicers are running around scrambling to find a ticket to go in the park and see the attractions, but we can ignore them and insert ours into the ticket taker here to enter the park proper. Straight ahead, we get a number one victory royale by interacting with the chug jug, which gives us our first tonic upgrade of the run. This tonic is always sports boost, which makes you move slightly faster. So here KPC purposely blows through his eve by spamming Electra Bolt, since the only way to take an eve hypo is to fully drain your eve, which KPC wants going into a fight against a big daddy ahead. Grabbing the tonic here triggered another Eleanor Angel message which KPC skipped with an audio skip. The tonic increases his drill damage which is nice and he's currently at an exact amount of eve for the big daddy fight. This amount of eve is perfect for throwing two barrels at the big daddy then shocking the water KPC stands in. He baits the big daddy to charge into the shocked water stunning him upon entrance which gives KPC time to reload plasmids then melee and shock the big daddy while he's in the water causing him to take extra damage. After dealing with the big daddy, we adopt the little sister, which is kind of the conceit of the game. You're supposed to run around and adopt little sisters, who you then bring to dead bodies to harvest the atom. This is the only time in the run that doing this is forced for story purposes, though. The bodies you need to harvest are set and always spawn in the same place, and in this level with this forced harvesting, you have two bodies that you need to harvest. Whenever a little sister harvests, you have to defend her from splicers that spawn as she fills up a progress bar on the left side of the screen below our health and eve. For the two harvests in this level, for some reason, if you don't kill any of the splicers in the first encounter, then none spawn in the second encounter. Luckily, the only splicers that spawn in this encounter are melee splicers, and by hopping onto the rubble pile he just hopped on, the splicers can't reach KPC and they just run up to the little sister. By zapping the splicers when they approach the little sister, they get distracted and run around without stopping her, letting the progress bar fill all the way up without lethal force being used at all. 
So on our right is a door that sparks are going to fly from in a bit as splicers attempt to cut their way through, and the door will bust open on a look trigger, meaning that it'll activate and happen once KPC looks at it. When he does that, he's going to grab the red explosive barrel near the box ahead and use it to kill some splicers that are behind the door so they don't block him when the sister finishes up harvesting in a moment. The splicers behind the door are okay to kill, with it only being the ones that spawn to mess with the sister during the harvest that we have to leave alive to make sure none spawn at the second harvest site. And killing the splicers behind the door is what KPC does best, because that's actually what his name stands for, kill potential child harmers. Once the little sister wraps up, KPC runs up to her and puts her on his shoulder and will make his way through the door where he just cleared out the splicers. He's now on his way to the next body that he has to gather Adam from, and on the ramp up ahead, a bathysphere is going to fall and kinda roll through him. The bathysphere pushes you to the left and gets you kinda stuck against the wall for a second or two, which is why KPC struggled with getting around the debris here for a moment. After going up this wood ramp, he's going to toss an exploding barrel at a splicer so that it doesn't bother him or the sister during the next gathering segment, and then he heads inside to the gathering site. Here he puts down the sister to do her thing in two pieces a nearby splicer that was already spawned in, and because he did the first gathering section correctly by not killing any splicers, none actually spawned during this gathering. KPC takes advantage of this downtime to collect any nearby resources, but makes sure to not go too far away from the harvest, otherwise the progress bar will stop filling. After collecting several resources, he's then going to hack a machine and purposely fail a few times in a row to lower his health in preparation for an upcoming trick. He doesn't have much to do other than wait and listen to the diegetic sounds of a song about a doggy in a window, so to kill time, he's going to tidy up the room a bit since it's an absolute mess, and will also make sure to hide the body like he's playing Hitman. While KPC goes about his chores, I'd just like to say, I hope you're all doing well. If you're not, I'd just like to say that I know how at times things can just honestly feel really hopeless, and that no matter what you do, you'll be stuck in the dark place you're in. I cannot stress this enough though, that no feeling is final. Things may feel insurmountable, but I promise you, they are not. No matter what you're facing, it cannot take away from you the fact that there is a tomorrow and that you will be here for it. I say this in every video, but it's something that I personally believe in always talking about, so I'll continue to do it, but just as a reminder, there is a tomorrow and no feeling is final. You can make it through today, and always remember that it's okay to talk to others. Getting back to the run, when the harvesting finishes, KPC grabs the little sister and uses telekinesis to grab an explosive barrel that he's going to carry for a bit. This is because he's going to perform a death warp with it in a specific spot. Remember what I said earlier about that if you have more than 1 HP and take damage that would kill you, your health instead lowers to 1 HP and you're given a few seconds of invincibility before you're then able to take damage again and die? If you have more than 1 HP and take damage that would kill you, your health instead lowers to 1 HP and you're given a few seconds of invincibility before you're then able to take damage again and die. Well, because of this mechanic, KPC needs to make sure he's at exactly 1 HP before he tries to die via barrel, otherwise he'd just be lowered to 1 HP and standing there twiddling his thumbs. This is why after he drops off the barrel here for later, he shocks some water and walks into it to take damage, and purposely fails hacking a machine to take even more damage. He then approaches the glowing vent to drop the little sister off, but chooses to harvest her instead of letting her live, which gives him 160 Adam instead of just 80. Adam can be used at Gatherer's Garden machines to purchase things like plasmids or tonic upgrades. After the harvest, KPC is going to hack a machine and purposely fail again just to make sure he has 1 HP instead of 2, and then he'll jump into a corner on some boxes near where he dropped off the barrel and throw the explosive barrel at his feet. Dying in specifically this corner respawns him back in the center area of the level near where the first harvest was, rather than respawning him in the Vita chamber that's in the same room he was just in. Additionally, dying in that corner gets you what's called a respawn animation cancel, which skips the animation of the camera traveling from your dead body to the Vita chamber. This only happens when you die in specific locations though, and saves around 2 seconds when you get it. So after running past these splicers, one of whom is canonically named Edna, and also running past a turret, KPC will eventually arrive at a gatherer's garden machine to purchase the incinerate plasmid for 90 Atom. This plasmid is what he's going to use to melt the ice that's blocking the tram he rode into the level on, which will let him go on to the next level. On his way out of the area, KPC will let the turret he passed shoot him a bit to get him down to 1 HP again before he'll shock the turret to make sure that it doesn't kill him. He's going to perform a death warp in a moment, but first there's a big sister on the other side of the door to leave this area that pulls you towards her when she busts the door down. By jumping at the doorframe right when he hits the trigger for the pull, KPC gets a little speed boost saving less than a second and makes a break to the right as soon as he can. He's going to run past the Vita chamber he spawned at a moment ago as he escapes from the big sister whom we want nothing to do with right now since we're a slight breeze away from death. 
After running through this door, he grabs an explosive barrel and is going to climb onto the collapsed clock in the middle of the room where he'll perform the death warp. By dying on top of this clock, you spawn in the Vita chamber on the other side of a locked door that's only supposed to open after you defeat the big sister, which serves as a shortcut back to the start of the level and saves around 20 to 25 seconds. Here KPC uses Incinerate to melt the ice that's blocking the tram from progressing and then heads into the control room on the left. After interacting with the glowing control panel to get the level moving along, he then stands in the corner and looks down. Because the big sister is so far away, the game will teleport her closer to us, and for some reason, if you look down until Sinclair starts talking, then the big sister will spawn in the room with you. To quickly take out the big sister, KPC is just going to zap him and whack him over and over, letting him quickly take her out and head to the next level. Killing the big sister not only gives you a lot of money, which is nice because, again, we'll have to buy fuel for our drill later, but it also gives a bit of Adam, which is important for upgrades later in the run. With that all taken care of, KPC is then able to head into the tram and activate it to head to the next level, Popper's Drop. Popper's Drop is the level where you get the Drill Dash ability, and normally when you traverse this level, you arrive at a spot where debris falls and blocks your path, and you have to go get Drill Dash to break through the debris to continue through the level. The debris is unbreakable until you get Drill Dash, but once you get it, then a special radio message plays that makes the debris breakable, so you then have to backtrack to the debris and dash through. The order of these steps will be important in just under 3 minutes, but in the meantime, we're still making our way in the general direction of Eleanor for the story, and when our tram arrives at the station, we're greeted by a Brute Splicer. These are new enemies to Bioshock 2 and are meant to be a big enemy that can contest us as a big daddy in size and power, but he lets us be for now. Right when the tram doors open, KPC is going to shoot a hacking dart to open the door ahead of him, and this level actually doesn't have a full level audio skip like the previous two. That's fine though, because a guy can only do so many frame perfect audio skips first try. After hanging a right through this door here, he's going to enter another room that's full of splicers where he'll climb over some rubble on the left to head to the next room. Again, as he passes through the level, KPC knows where all the money in the area is and grabs it as he passes to make sure he has enough for fuel later on. Up ahead, he's going to interact with a gatherer's garden and use all the atom he's collected so far to purchase some plasmids and upgrades. First, he's going to buy an extra plasmid slot and then the decoy plasmid. Plant a decoy to distract foes. Watch as they attack the wrong man. He then buys the Winter Blast plasmid, which he equips in place of the Electrobolt plasmid. Freeze your enemies. Shatter them into a thousand pieces. Last, he purchases the Drill Lurker Tonic, which quiets your footsteps and increases melee damage against unaware enemies, especially when using the drill. Here, he'll hack a vending machine across the room real quick and fail on purpose to lower his health in anticipation for an upcoming death warp. He then lays down a decoy and gets moving through the area by hitmanning a door as he makes his way to get the research camera, which he'll use for a skip called Early Drill Dash. When used, the camera films your gameplay as if you're playing Outlast and you perform research by dealing damage to enemies, which provides you with rewards. When you perform enough research on a Brute Splicer like the one we saw at the start of the level, you get the Drill Dash ability, which, believe it or not, lets you dash with your drill, which is a fast way of getting around and is useful for the speedrun. KPC threw down the decoy in the center of the room to lure a Brute Splicer to it and cause him to stick around long enough for KPC to hit him with a Winter Blast in a second. This freezes him long enough to break his AI and freeze in place when he's supposed to actually run away and despawn after a short period of time. This isn't the brute you're supposed to research for Drill Dash, but freezing this brute in place like this and researching him saves around a minute compared to doing it to the brute later in the level. Worth noting, if you hit enemies with the same damage source over and over, you get diminishing returns on the amount of research done. By cycling through damage sources though, you get more research done quickly. After Winter Blasting the Brute and dropping down to grab the camera, KPC will head down a hall and film a thuggish splicer on the left, whom you have to research to open up the door to leave this shop, and will then blast the frozen in place Brute with an array of plasmids and weapons to maximize research. As soon as research completes, KPC will let the splicers in the room kill him. Researching this Brute gives him Drill Dash way earlier than intended, and he's doing this level all out of order with the debris having not even fallen and the special message not playing due to getting Drill Dash in an unintended way. If he tried to continue on as normal after getting Drill Dash, the debris would fall and then it would be unbreakable for a while with you having to wait until it becomes breakable to be able to pass. That is unless you die after getting Drill Dash early, which for some reason causes the special message to play that makes the rocks breakable, so dying to the splicers was to let him be able to progress through the level without having to wait. The spot where the debris falls is just two doors ahead, and when he goes through and the debris falls, KPC takes a moment to use the fuel station to top off on his drill fuel since it's expensive and you want to try and get free fuel whenever possible. So a Drill Dash is done by left-clicking to use your drill, and then pressing Shift. 
Drill Dash pairs super well with the decoy plasmid since you can use decoys to open automatic doors ahead of you and in some cases can be used to bait enemies like brutes out of the direction you're dashing. The thing about dashing though is similar to when you aim down sights in a first person shooter, your camera sensitivity is drastically reduced when doing it. This is detrimental to using Drill Dash as a primary movement method through levels, which is why KPC plays Bioshock 2 with an ungodly high sensitivity so that turning while Drill Dashing is much easier. There is a limit on how far you can turn in a Drill Dash, like you can't set your sensitivity to 16,000 DPI and then Drill Dash in a circle, but you can turn a maximum of like 20 degrees from where you started aiming the dash. So here he dashed into a room with a hidden button behind a poster that he pressed to open up a nearby door. Behind the door is a door with a window that will brush off to have a cutscene conversation with Grace Holloway, a woman who works for Sophia Lamb. Not only does she show us how to properly sit in a chair, but she also gives us an up-close and personal look at her medium-quality textured marshmallow clothing. Once our conversation with her is over, the door between us will open and we'll be able to enter and grab the key we need to be able to progress through the level. You're given the option to either let Grace live or to kill her, but KPC just ignores her since killing her doesn't benefit us for the run, and taking a second to swing our drill and kill her is slow lower than giving her the silent treatment. Although, KPC did once accidentally kill her when the strat was to light the chair in the room on fire and death warp using it. When KPC used the burning chair to die, the chair kicked out from under him, bounced off the wall, and landed on Grace, causing the fire damage to kill her. So after the door opens, KPC will grab the key and begin making his way back through the level towards the tram that he takes between levels. On the way, he'll stop at a drill refuel station, which is the reason why the death warp from Grace's room isn't done in the run anymore. The reason he's heading back to the tram is because, believe it or not, we're going to be riding it to the next level, Siren Alley. Something worth noting is that the constant drill dashing all over the place is basically what the run used to be from here on out. There was a different piece of tech found that we'll cover in a couple levels that removed a lot of drill dashing later in the run, but we'll get there when we get there. Before that piece of tech was discovered though, the run was largely dashing, money management, and making sure you didn't run out of fuel. So right now in the story, we know that Sophia Lamb plans to turn Eleanor into more or less a super soldier and condition her to act only for Sophia's own goals. Meanwhile, we've learned that Sinclair, the dude chirping in our ear here and there so far, is planning to take control of Rapture from Sophia and sell its technology to the surface world. And overall, our goal is still to get to Eleanor and rescue her. Wait, actually, let me double check that. Um... Yeah, we're still trying to save her. That's really all that's going on. So in the next level, Siren Alley, you'll see a Sinclair radio image pop up in the bottom right corner and stay there for the duration of the level. This is essentially the radio messages breaking and stopping from playing. KPC isn't too sure why this happens, but it's believed that it has something to do with the fact that the objectives in the previous level were done out of order, causing something to break when you enter this level due to the buildup of messages from the previous level that were supposed to play. So our tram just got hit by an actual fucking torpedo, damaging it and flinging us from it, and it was all the doing of one of Sophia Lamb's lieutenants, Father Simon Wales. If I'm being honest, not great for our plans to get to Eleanor, but this derailment is only temporary, because there's a functioning tram car we can use in Dionysus Park, but to get there, we have to go through Siren Alley and drain the water from Dionysus Park. So when KPC gained control, he began jumping his way through the seafloor, since, again, it's faster to jump than run while in and underwater. The location where he gained control on the seafloor is actually the exit to the level, and when we return there later, some interesting drill dash stuff will happen, but you'll have to wait to see that for yourself. So once this airlock drains and he gets inside, KPC will take a right and drill dash past all the splicers to the far end of the plaza that looks like yesterday's Main Street. When drill dashing, the game has an auto-aim feature where if you're kinda close to looking at an enemy, your dash will snap onto the enemy and end when you collide with them. This is why you'll typically see KPC looking generally downward while drill dashing. In this room is a combat encounter, but the initial splicers that spawn in here aren't part of it, so KPC clears them out so they don't nag him later or distract the turret that he hacks here to help with the combat encounter. After clearing them out, the screen fades to black for a moment, and while it does, he attempts to navigate towards a vending machine in the dark. He'll then hack the machine, making all of the products a bit cheaper, and will fill up on drill fuel. After that, the combat encounter will begin. KPC will load up a bunch of trap rivets in a specific spot directly below where the splicers are going to spawn from during the fight's first phase. He'll take out his research camera for the fight, since researching spider splicers, which are the type of splicer that spawn here, gives you a movement speed bonus, which is obviously good for the speedrun. Additionally, he hacked the turret to help kill these guys, since damage with the turret plus winter blast gives the most research possible, which you'll be able to see ticking up on the left side of the screen when he starts researching here. This fight has two phases, with the first phase being just three splicers that you want to kill as quickly as you can. 
The third splicer can spawn either from the hole above you or across the room, and in this run it was the latter, but killing that splicer ASAP is important because as soon as you kill him, phase 2 begins and a timer starts ticking behind the scenes. Phase 2 initially consists of more splicer spawning, but as soon as the timer reaches a certain value, a brute spawns behind a door that KPC is actually going to parkour to in a moment and kinda go out of bounds behind. First though, KPC kills a few of the Phase 2 splicers just to get additional research points, so let's watch him do that for a moment. After getting additional research points and doing some looting for resources, KPC begins setting himself up for the parkour by hopping on the ledge here and dropping down onto these pipes. He then just has to jump across to this bigger pipe and onto the platform where he can walk behind the door that the brute spawns behind. As soon as Barney Gumble spawns, KPC researches him as he kills him using Winter Blast intermittently while killing him to both make his health go down faster and also to keep him frozen. Killing him early behind the door saves around 10 to 15 seconds. After killing the Moe's regular, KPC hopped back down into the room and drill dashed to the next room. Here he dashes past some splicers, including Homer, who comes charging out of the room we enter on the left here as he looks to avenge his drinking buddy. KPC loots this body here real quick for a couple bucks and some mini turrets and dashes into the next room to a vending machine that he tops off his fuel at. After then going through this door and down the hallway, he'll enter the room with the second combat encounter of the level, which ends in a boss fight. Right away, KPC throws down some mini turrets with his hack tool to help clear out enemies and generate more research points, and researches all the splicers as he kills them to get more points to further upgrade things like damage and move speed. After taking out a couple splicers and jumping down, a brute spawns up above and you have to look up at him to get him to come down. Once Homer pulls out some moves from his wrestling days to get down to us, KPC freezes him and smacks him over and over until he's dead, and once he is, then the boss comes out to play, Father Simon Wales, the fucker who wrecked our tram. KPC freezes him as he air Jordans, and then KPC lets his mini turret shoot Father Simon a ton to get an absolutely massive amount of research points. Once Father Simon is excommunicated, KPC loots a key off his body and fails a hack on a security bot to lower his health to 1 HP in preparation for a death warp, and after activating the pumps to drain Dionysus Park, he waits a moment before lighting a box on fire and death warping. The waiting is intentional for something that we'll see in a few moments, but something worth noting is that while in Bioshock 1 you could throw fire anywhere and the fire would stick for you to walk through and damage yourself, in Bioshock 2 you have to actually light things on fire. Like, in the first game you could just throw fire onto the floor and it'd stay there, but that won't cut it here. Gotta actually commit arson, dems the rules. So the level is now flooding, and a door in the next room is going to burst and push us backwards like with the glass breaking earlier, so KPC makes his way next to the door and stands with his back against the wall, so when the water comes through and pushes him, he won't get pushed back down the hallway and have to trek back to the door again. Before, this level was definitely damp, with it being an underwater city and all, but now it's absolutely moist. So because we're underwater, we don't have access to our weapons or plasmids, except for some reason our decoy is still visually present. Although, because we waited a moment before death warping, then when we cross through the airlock just ahead, we can press swap weapons and they actually come out and stay out. We can then perform a drill dash, and drill dashing out of the airlock lets you keep your drill, and you're able to dash while underwater all the way to the exit. Again, this is only possible due to the fact that KPC waited a moment before death warping, and it isn't really understood why this works how it does. This is that interesting drill dash thing that I was referring to when we started the level. And if you don't find that interesting, then you gotta lower your standards because that shit is fascinating as hell. So we've now wrapped up Siren Alley, which brings us to the next level, Dionysus Park. KPC is going to pretty much drill dash through the intended route of this level, which will bring him to the final room of the level where a fresh tram is waiting for him. On his way through the level, he's going to make a quick pit stop near the start to fill up his fuel, and also at one point he'll have to kill a Houdini Splicer to progress, which he'll do with the help of another mini turret, which he'll also use to get a ton of research points again. So this is the level where the big glitch from the speedrun of Bioshock 1 makes a return. Wall Clips For one reason or another, we haven't been able to use wall clips to break levels so far in the run, with the reasons mostly being that certain triggers to progress through levels are tied to objectives that we can't skip. From here on out though, every level has a wall clip of sorts. To perform a wall clip, you need an enemy, typically a splicer, and the telekinesis plasmid. By standing on an alive splicer's head and killing them, then you sort of become tied to the splicer's dead body, and wherever the body goes, you go. I like to refer to this action as body surfing for short. 
When you're on the splicer's body, the splicer's body has a hitbox while your body does not. This means that if you stand on the edge of a splicer while body surfing and throw the body into a wall, the splicer will stop at the wall but you clip through. That's the gist of it anyways, now let's talk details. So first for getting onto a splicer's head, you need to walk onto them from somewhere that's around the same level as their head. If you jump onto their head or drop onto them, you'll bounce off. This makes stairs and railings great places to set up wall clips at, and honestly, the fact that there's perfect setup spots for all the wall clips in this run is nothing short of a miracle. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you saw how fucked up that ashtray setup was in the run of Bioshock 1, like, just get that disgusting shit away from me. So once you're on their head, you're on there real good. You can get off easily by moving or jumping off, but if you don't move or jump, then wherever the splicer goes, you go. Normally, killing a splicer causes them to lose their hitbox, but for some reason, if you're on top of their head when you kill them, then you stay on top of their dead body and they have a hitbox while you don't, like I mentioned a moment ago. You have to be careful with your positioning when killing them though, because if you collide with anything on the way down after killing them, like the weapons they're holding or a mask they're wearing, then you actually get bumped off their body. This is why you'll notice KPC taking extra precautions when he mounts a splicer to make sure that he's on the opposite side of their body from things like their weapons or masks. Once the splicer's dead and you're ready to body surf, then you can do so by moving the body with telekinesis. There's a bit of a system for flying around and steering, and in Bioshock 2, that flying system is a little scuffed. Imagine that the splicer's body has a center point somewhere around just below the splicer's belly button. Wherever you stand on the splicer in relation to that center point when you use telekinesis on the body is the direction that you and the body go flying in. It's just like one of those, oh god, what are they called, um... Vector! Yeah, a vector, where your speed and direction are entirely based on your direction and distance from the center point of the body. In Bioshock 1, flying around is easily done since you can look straight down, position yourself easily, and use telekinesis on the body since you're looking down at it. Well, this is where Bioshock 2 makes wall clips a little scuffed. You can't look straight down in this game. This means that if you're going to position yourself on the edge of a body and try to look straight down at it, you'll be looking past the body at just the ground, so you can't grab the body with telekinesis. Because of this, then whenever KPC needs to position himself at the edge of the body to clip through a wall, he'll look sideways at the body so that the body is either on the left or right of him, and the wall he needs to clip through is on the opposite side of him as the body. He then uses telekinesis on the body and whips the camera in the direction of the wall to make sure that's the direction he's headed. Something else that makes this difficult is going straight up to gain height. In the run of the first Bioshock, there are several points where you stand directly over the center of the body and then use telekinesis on the body in its center point. When you do this, you gain height straight up, with being crouched keeping you relatively low but standing up causing you to gain a lot of height. The crouching versus standing thing remains in this game with you gaining a lot of height by body surfing while standing, but it's not really possible to stand on the center of the body and look straight down to telekinesis the body's center point. The last thing that makes wall clips hinky in Bioshock 2 is that while the damage of telekinesis was nerfed in this game like I talked about earlier, the speed and intensity of the throws were increased, so it's much more difficult to finesse your body surfing since everything is much more intense and fast. The physics are souped up not just for the throws, but also just grabbing and holding the splicer, so the much more intense physics make it a lot harder to control in general. Because of this, KPC often will grab the body with telekinesis to move it, and then press the button to drop the body at almost the exact same time. This gives him more mild telekinesis grabs, letting him traverse a little more delicately. This doesn't always get the job done though, because sometimes you really only need to move a couple feet. When the situation calls for this, KPC uses his drill to whack the body that's under him, causing the body to move and for him to move since he's tied to the body. Just some casual breakage of the first law of motion. So for this first clip, KPC freezes the splicer here in place next to the railing and clears out the other one, then climbs onto the frozen splicer's head. He then throws out a decoy across the room so that the splicer will turn to face it, ensuring that when KPC stands kinda on his back to avoid his weapon and mask, that he also won't bump into the nearby rail or bench. After killing the splicer after it unfroze so its body didn't shatter, KPC carefully moves it wide of the objects in front of him and then does a super super mild telekinesis grab and release to end up in front of the tram by some orange plants. The switch to leave the level is in the front of the tram, so after positioning himself on the edge of the body between it and the tram, KPC will look sideways and use telekinesis on the body, swinging his camera to the left while doing so and staying crouched to avoid gaining too much height. This clips him into the tram where he then uncrouches to be able to reach the switch and finish the level. 
While we wait for the level to end, it's worth noting that after you clip through walls, you have to jump off the body to be able to move again. It didn't come into play here since he didn't need to move to activate the switch, but it's pretty standard otherwise. Additionally, you can go through the wall since you don't have a hitbox, but the body cannot, so as I said in the other Bioshock video, one body, one wall, dems the rules. After the level finally ends, we're brought to the next level, Fontaine Futuristics. So earlier I mentioned that every level from here on out has a wall clip of sorts and included a note saying this was kinda true. The Bioshock 2 speedrunning community divides this level up into two separate levels, Fontaine Futuristics 1 and 2, or FF1 and FF2 for short. The reason for the level split is because the level is formatted as more or less two separate level sized areas that are connected by an underwater area, so for the sake of this video and doing things how the speedrunning community does it, we'll consider these two separate levels for the video. The kinda true part of every level having a wall clip comes into play with the fact that there's a wall clip in FF1, but not in FF2, so like, yeah, there's a level missing a wall clip by the speedrun community's framing of levels, but there's still one on every level as the developers designed. So as KPC gets moving through this level, he grabs an audio diary on the left ahead, which is important for the last level, and casually walks as opposed to dashing since he needs to wait for the splicer to get into this spot anyways, where KPC freezes him in place. After shattering the splicer on the side like their carpet in Aladdin The Return of Jafar, KPC does some parkour to get on top of all this covered furniture before walking onto the frozen splicer's head and setting up the body surf. He's then going to work on moving the body through the nearby door and down the hallway to an airlock, where he'll activate it to go outside while still maintaining the body surf. What KPC is going to do once he gets outside is body surf to skip pretty much all of FF1 and end up at the entrance of FF2. You may be asking why he can't just go straight to the end of the level, and that's because there's no feasible way to clip into the last area where you leave the level because of so many solid rocks and other things surrounding it. One of the things surrounding it is what KPC refers to as a no-player zone, which is exactly what it sounds like, an area that the player cannot enter. Other things, like the splicer we're riding, can go through no-player zones, though. While we're body surfing, our position is tied to the splicer's position, even when the splicer's in a place where the game can't have us be, like a no-player zone, and as soon as the splicer's body exits the no-player zone, we're immediately warped to be on top of the splicer again. You may be thinking that we could just be outside the no-player zone and throw the splicer at the last area to clip in, and we'd be fine since we'd exit the no-player zone with the clip and be put inside the final area. Unfortunately, the actual no-player zone is much bigger than what I've shown so far, and with the way things are laid out, and again, all the solid rocks in the area, clipping in just doesn't work out. So because we can't clip into the final room and just leave the level, we settle for the second best thing, which is to fly around out of bounds with our splicer to skip to FF2. First, when the water is filling up the airlock, KPC is going to spam cycle through his plasmids, which you can see at the top of the screen. For some reason, doing this while the airlock fills up and as the game should be taking away access to weapons and plasmids, the game just doesn't, and you can still use plasmids while underwater. Once the door opens up, KPC is going to use telekinesis on the splicer to fly up and in front of the big Fontaine Futuristics building which houses most of FF1, like the building that houses the mummy ride. Again, his goal is to get to the entrance of FF2, but he can't just fly straight there because most of the way is blocked by a giant no-player zone above the map. Also, worth noting to avoid confusion, when looking at this map for reference, we're flying above the map and out of bounds for pretty much the whole time, so don't get confused thinking we're passing through walls and rooms constantly, we're just above them all. Just like how I'm above giving you up, I'm never gonna do that. So our path to the entrance of FF2 is blocked by a giant no-player zone. I mentioned earlier that splicers can pass through no-player zones, and if the splicer we're body surfing enters the no-player zone, it can move around in there, but we'll be observing like we're fry at the edge of the universe. As soon as the splicer exits the no-player zone though, then we snap into position on top of it, wherever it is. Delta, the big daddy we play as, is able to throw things way farther than Jack can in Bioshock 1, and because of this, you'd think that we could just throw the splicer across the entire distance of the no-player zone, and we teleport to the body when it clears the other side. Telekinesis is certainly powerful enough to make that throw, but there isn't a consistent setup to doing it. Luckily, there's an area in the center of the no-player zone that's a, um, no no-player zone, or I guess just a gap in the no-player zone. This means that KPC can throw the splicer from the edge of the no-player zone into the gap, causing him to teleport onto the splicer in the gap. He's then going to fly up to get more height and throw the body over the remainder of the no-player zone to reach the area of the map where the entrance to FF2 is. 
When he emerges on the other side of the no player zone, he'll have entered another underwater area, and because of this, the game takes away his plasmids again. He has two options here to regain the plasmids. He can either quick save and quick load, with him spamming to cycle through his plasmids during the quick load part, which for some reason gives him back the plasmids, or he can just sit there and ride the splicer's body as it floats up in the water. This will eventually raise KPC up high enough to be considered above the water, meaning that the game thinks he's out of the water and gives him back his plasmids. Waiting to float up like this is around 10 seconds slower than just doing the quick save quick load strat, but when recording the clips for this segmented run, he wanted to do the entirety of FF1 without quick saving or quick loading once. Usually, runners will quick save and quick load a lot throughout the body surfing process in case anything goes wrong, but KPC took it upon himself to grind this level out for 3 hours until he got it all in one segment without having to make any safety saves, and he wasn't about to ruin the single segment without saves by doing one just to save 10 seconds here. Speaking from experience, sometimes as a speedrunner the time loss is worth it when you do cool shit. So once he floats up high enough to regain plasmid use, he'll then throw the splicer one final time down towards the lower underwater area, which is where the door to enter FF2 is, which he'll float down to in due time. Before body surfing and wall clips were found, runners would have to go through FF1 and do a skip called Theater Skip, but that's all skipped now, so KPC likes to jokingly call this segment Theater Skip Skip. It saves around 3.5 minutes, just like the wall clip in Dionysus Park, and saves 9 minutes over the FF1 glitchless route. Alright, let's see all this come together at full speed now. So to start FF2, KPC is going to drill dash down the hallways once this door opens and will grab two heat seeking rockets on his left near the end of the dash as the rockets bounce around. Because we don't do a full level audio skip on this level, there's a ton of dialogue that plays in this area that's slow to listen to. KPC is actually going to be skipping three of them by quick saving and quick loading, then pressing T to play the previous audio diary after each quick load to skip each message. He can't just press T when the messages start to skip each message, since the messages will only get skipped right after a quick load. This means there are two random instances of saving and loading over the next few minutes with him having just done the first one, but now you know what they are, and the three audio skips in total save a minute and ten seconds. The mission for this area is you have to turn on the power with him having already flipped the two circuit breakers and activating the power main here, followed by him swapping out his incinerate plasmid with electro bolt since he doesn't need incinerate for the rest of the run, but electro bolt is needed a little later on. After then skipping another message, he'll look up at the big tank in the middle of the room to activate a look trigger that causes a piece of dialogue to play around 10 seconds early where Alex the Great does a short scream. After then doing the last audio skip of this area, KPC will be tasked with collecting four atom-infused plants. The game gives you one as an example that you're supposed to collect before setting off in the level and collecting the other three, but by having use bound to your scroll wheel, you can just use the scroll wheel on the plant and it'll pick up multiple plants before it disappears, which is called the plant duplication glitch and saves two minutes overall. You can count exactly how many plants are picked up by how many splashes pop from where the plant was, but the issue is if you accidentally pick up too many plants. When you interact with the plant, two big daddies spawn in the room that you have to fight, but if you collect more plants, then more and more big daddies will spawn based on how many you picked up, with it being possible to create your own big daddy discotheque. In this run, KPC picked up somewhere between 7 and 10 plants, meaning that two waves of two big daddies spawned. After he cleared out the first daddy wave, he pressed the nearby button that activates the final fight of the level where a bunch of enemies, including big daddies, spawn after a 30 or so second timer. This fight consists of three big daddies and splicers you need to take out, plus a Houdini splicer who jumps around that you can actually ignore. The general plan of attack is to use the heat-seeking rockets and normal grenades on daddies and the machine gun on splicers, but right here he had good luck with a splicer running next to a big daddy as he was about to shoot him with a rocket, so two birds with one stone there. 
A lot of figuring out where the enemies spawn in this fight is using audio to your advantage and listening for where they are in the room, but for the most part, they spawn on the opposite side of the room from you, so it's a lot of back and forth while listening. While making his way to the other side of the room to look for the final big daddy, he spots it on the right side along the way. He ran out of rockets while trying to kill it, so he ended up using his machine gun and drill to finish the job. After the fight, he has to skip two more dialogues that are going to play, and after the second, he'll stare at the key that's in the panel in front of him. This is the key that we need to grab to leave the area, and it's been sticking out like this the entire fucking time, but if you watch closely, you can see the key we're supposed to interact with eject and overlap with the other key before we're able to take it. After grabbing one to two keys, KPC begins making his way to the end of the level, but not before skipping another dialogue line. In total, this audio skip combined with the two right before grabbing the key save around 40 seconds. All we have to do now is head back the way we came, with KPC drill dashing down this plant-filled hallway to the airlock. Back in the water outside, he'll insert the key into a lamppost looking thing which will make a giant false rock move down to expose the exit of the level. Again, some of you may be asking why we couldn't just clip through this rock to leave the level since we were here earlier while body surfing, and it's just that the rock is too big to clip all the way through and there's no way to get to the exit door from out of bounds. Once the rock is lowered and he waits for the airlock door to finally open, KPC will dash forward to the hidden elevator and activate it with the key he grabbed, putting an end to Fontaine Futuristics as a whole and leading to the penultimate level, Outer Persephone, I mean Persephone. After my death, you can do more. Now, please, I ask you to grant me peace. Goodbye, my friend, and thank you. So Outer Persephone is the level where Eleanor is being kept, and she recently flew domestic, so she's being kept in a quarantine room. Normally, this level consists of you getting to the room she's being kept in, and long story short, you get subdued by Sophia Lamb, who severs your connection to Eleanor, which weakens Delta's heart in the process. I guess the severing explains why this level starts with you in an elevator. This would then lead to you controlling a little sister due to a plasmid Eleanor sneaks you, but we're going to be skipping all of that. So when the elevator opens up, we set off into Lumen with KPC grabbing a proximity mine right away before grabbing a remote hack dart at the desk and beginning to drill dash down hallways. There are medical carts all over the place in this level and they're an absolute nightmare for speedrunners. If you bump into one while dashing, both the cart and you get horribly thrown about. At the end of this hallway, they mess with his movement a bit, and when he goes through this door here, he's going to bump into a cart on his right that flings about and bumps KPC to the left a bit here. This is a super, super mild effect compared to what can happen. Right here, KPC enters a room with red lights everywhere, which is the room that holds the quarantine room where Eleanor is located. After hacking the vending machine across the room in what's one of the more difficult hacks since it's late in the game, he activates the quarantine room controls which starts a timer that two big sisters spawn at the end of. While the timer is ticking, KPC begins prepping the room for the fight by piling up a bunch of explosive tanks where the big sisters enter the room at, and will put down a proximity mine with the tanks when he's done. The fight isn't really that hard to do while playing on the easy difficulty, but he still wants to make sure that it goes as quickly and smoothly as possible. Once the room is all Kevin McAllistered up, KPC walks over to top off on drill fuel before going back to the spot where Marv and Harry are going to drop down from. Also, this is actually what KPC's name stands for, Kevin McAllister. The pee is silent, just like how you try to make your pee when you're peeing at a friend's house in the bathroom's in earshot. Once Marv and Harry make their grand entrance, KPC starts wailing on them, and it's hard to see because of the textures, but the wet bandits end up living up to their name by standing and falling in water, meaning they take more damage when shocked. This doesn't really happen much, and it led to KPC having the cleanest fight he's ever had. Once Harry bites the dust, KPC stands on this ledge so that Marv will do a jump attack at him, causing Marv to land below KPC who then freezes her and walks onto her head. Very in character for Kevin McAllister. He then waits to kill Marv until she walks out of the water since it's super annoying to get her body out of the water. KPC's goal now is to perform a wall clip with Marv's shambling corpse, but the thing about Big Sisters is that you can't move their bodies with telekinesis. This makes moving her body incredibly hard and makes this level just beyond difficult for the speedrun. You can move her body very slowly with the drill, but you can't push the body upstairs with the drill, which sucks since we need to get her up a few steps. The only way to move her up is to grab a medical cart with telekinesis and shove it into her body to push her, which usually takes a while to get her shoved up these stairs, but KPC got this absolutely clean shove first try, which doesn't happen very often. 
With Marv on the landing, KPC adjusts the orientation of her body since to perform the wall clip here, you need her to be lying parallel to the door, which he got super lucky with her being largely parallel to the door from the get-go, but he still had to make some minor adjustments to get it just right. To clip through the wall then, he has to grab the medical card again and first place it on the landing, but there was a candle that he accidentally grabbed initially that was in the way that he had to move before doing the clip. Something super frustrating about this game is if there's a small item like a rock or candle anywhere near where you aim telekinesis, it'll always grab the small object instead of the thing you're aiming at. Once he gets the card on the landing, he makes a safety save. Something worth noting is that if you're crouched when you make a save, then after the save finishes, you'll be uncrouched and pushed off the body, but if you load the save, then you'll be crouched again and still on the body. He's mostly crouched the whole time while moving Marv, but that's something he has to account for when making the safety save. Once he grabs the cart, he has to wait for it to rotate to a good orientation where part of it is close enough to the ground that it'll catch on Marv's body, so that KPC can then rotate his camera quickly and slam the cart into Marv, which will then push him at high enough speeds to clip through the door. In this run, he almost got it on the first try, which is absolutely wild, but unfortunately, it was just barely not far enough through the door. His luck hasn't run out though, because when he loads the safety save and grabs the cart again, the cart happens to be in a good orientation immediately, so he attempts and successfully performs the clip right away. This puts him in the final room of the level, letting him interact with the door to leave. This wall clip, which KPC calls the wall clip designed by Stan, saves over 4 minutes when compared to the non-wall clip any percent route, and 5.5 and minutes when compared to the glitchless route. Between the fast fight, getting up the stairs first try with good orientation, and getting this clip second try, this attempt of the level ended up being KPC's gold split. He's never done it faster than this. Oh, he wrote Satan and not Stan. Anyways, this brings us to the final level in the game, Inner Persephone. KPC is going to perform a full level audio skip at the start of this level by pressing T as he passes a precise spot, correctly doing it on the same frame as an Eleanor dialogue begins, saving around a minute throughout this level. He then drill dashes up into this big hub room up these stairs and walks to hit a trigger that starts a dialogue that's skipped immediately thanks to the full level audio skip. We're locked in this hub room for a few seconds before some gates open to the rest of the level, so he uses this time to grab some stuff around the room for fun. Once the gate opens here, several enemies spawn in the area, which KPC clears out save for a brute that spawns. This level is structured with this hub area and three huge offshoot areas with a bunch of stuff to do that you're supposed to go through, and it's a relatively long level, but the devs messed up and put the end of the level behind a paper-thin door. KPC purposely leaves the brute alive since all the other splicers that spawn are ranged so they can't be easily baited into position since they won't chase you to attack. KPC stands at the top of the stairs to try and get the brute in a specific spot, but the brute had other plans this run and ran to the wrong spot, so KPC froze him and ended up using a backup strat of standing in this corner between the railing and pillar. Once the brute's in the right spot, he freezes it and jumps out from the corner, then walks onto the brute's head. Normally, the plan here is to lower the brute to 1 HP and use a decoy to lure him to the final door, but KPC accidentally killed him here and had to resort to using telekinesis to body surf to the door. Using telekinesis for this is definitely a viable strategy, but it's just not super consistent. Goes to show that not everything goes perfect in speedruns, and sometimes you just have to wing it. And wing it, KPC definitely did, because it's honestly a miracle that he didn't get bumped off the body when surfing here with how chaotic the flight ended up being due to the brute's positioning. Once he gets the brute to the door, he positions himself on the edge of the brute's body and faces so the door is to the left and the brute is to the right, then uses telekinesis and looks to the left to clip through the door. All he needs to do now is enter the elevator to officially end the run. Here's two fun facts. First, the final room we clipped into has you moving like you're underwater while you're in it. This is because later in the level you actually flood the whole area, but this room just loads in as underwater since you're not supposed to be able to enter it until you flood the level as a whole. The second fun fact is that the final clip saves around 8 minutes when compared to the non-wall clip any percent route and around 11 minutes compared to the glitchless route. That means that this one wall clip alone saves around as much time as every wall clip in the first Bioshock combined. Finishing up the game leads to a cutscene of us and Eleanor attempting to flee Rapture via an escape pod, but running into a trap that Sophia Lamb had set for us. This mortally wounds Delta, the big daddy we're playing as, and we're then given one of several endings. Because we harvested a little sister but spared the lives of people like Grace Holloway, then we get one of the two bad endings of the game, where Eleanor spares Sophia and all the evil corrupt adults live, but the little sisters are canonically dead. So if you've made it to the end of the run, thank you so much on behalf of both myself and KPC for watching. And also, thank you so much to KPC for helping make this video. The reception to our video covering the Any% percent run of Bioshock was so positive that we decided pretty much right after releasing it that we should get working on the second one, so that's what we did. 
KPC absolutely killed it with the runs for both videos and was nothing but delightful to work with overall. If you want to check out more Bioshock and Bioshock 2 runs, then check out KPC's channel, link is in the description. And if you want to learn more about runs of this game, other categories, or check out other runners as well, then head on over to speedrun.com and use that search bar. I'd also like to take a moment and say thank you so much to everyone who supports the channel on Patreon. We're only a couple patrons away from hitting the 325 patron milestone, and when we do, I'll be posting a list of speedruns I've selected that patrons will be able to vote on to decide a future speedrun explained video. And if we eventually get to 350 patrons, then we'll do another poll where patrons decide, except all the runs included in that poll will be submitted by patrons. We've done this in the past several times, with winners being the Silent Assassin Suit Only speedrun of Hitman 2016, Subnautica Any% percent, and one that I can't name publicly yet since the video is currently in the works. If submitting runs for polls and voting on them sounds like something you'd like to participate in, then you can do so by contributing as little as $1 a month. Doing that not only lets you participate in polls, but you also get access to videos early, versions without the ad reads, updates on videos as they're being made, and more. It's entirely unnecessary, yet so many of you choose to do it anyways, so again, thank you to all of you who support. And as always, last but not least, check out the Tomato Anus Discord server. The community we built is incredibly welcoming and inclusive, and they're always down to chat with new faces and just hang out. That's all for this video though. This was an any% percent speedrun of Bioshock 2, I've been Tomato Anus, and I hope you have an above average day.